I'm taking you back into First uh, Peter today, that it might be better understood why, and you must forgive some of the things I'm going to say, don't, don't make the mistake of a poor listener and rush into judging my words, but receive them with an open heart because this is such a difficult subject to treat. And it is the subject of submission to suffering. See, I think I now finally understand why I cannot connect with most of modern Christianity. There is nowhere, not one place, that I can find in the Bible that says self first. Everything is self takes a back seat, and it is God front and center. When we encounter suffering in our uh, contemporary today world, there's always the utterance, you must be out of God's will. I'm seeing at least probably five or ten people that I know right away looking through the congregation who have just in the last week or ten days lost their job. And I'm sure their anxiety their suffering, their worries, how am I going to get by? The world would say there's, there's obviously something wrong with you because if you were a good worker or if you were meeting the mark of the standards, this wouldn't be happening to you. Or those who, of you who are sick or who have sick people in your household. I don't know about you, but I'm so sick of a Christianity that, that tells you and me that because we suffer, that somehow we don't got it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the fact that, and I just, I'm venting this now because I want you to know where this is coming from, that we would do so well, we would prosper as a body even under the duress of stress and tribulation. We would prosper as a body, and I'm speaking of churches, and obviously the churches of people who belong to the Lord. If we finally cross that hurdle, Jesus said, we're not going to be immune or excused from suffering. In fact, if you follow him, that is going to be part of your lot. And he didn't describe the exact mode and method that you will have to endure. But I can tell you one thing. The sufferings that he bore, our sorrows, become the vehicle and the media through which we obtain eternal joy, and there's no other way about it. He bore our sorrows. He bore our sickness. He bore our sins. That is the medium, our disaster, that we might see, whether it's sickness, sin, whatever matter you want to address, he bore it all, and that becomes the vehicle for me to approach with the knowledge that I will be a partaker in his suffering. He was hated without a cause. I will be a partaker in the things that in some microcosm he had to endure for the sake of the cross, much as I stand and you are here in the sanctuary and anyone listening to me for the sake of the true message of the cross. And I will also be a partaker in his joy and the eternal rewards and the glories that follow. You can't have one without the other. Let no one convince you that Christianity is just some sugar-coated, feel-good, you know, you, you came down, you got it, you're great, now go. I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's difficult for me to say this, but I'm telling you, you know you are following God, and you know you are following the Son of God when it seems like every single path you walk down is molasses under your feet, but at least you have the knowledge that what drops on your tongue is the honey of God's Word and the sweetness that awaits the eternal glory. Our light affliction is only for a little while. Keep that in your brain, and you're closer to the kingdom of God than most other people who like to just make the display of how joyous they're filled right now. Keep that in your mind. Now, 1 Peter gives me this background. We got as far as um, the last place that I opened up was uh, the second, 1 Peter, chapter 2, and we ended at verse 9. That was, 
that you should show forth, and we explain what that is. I explained to you what that is, the praises, literally the excellencies, the virtues of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now begins a new setting, which if not, if it is not explained in the context, in the social and historical context, you will not understand it and be able to apply it in the now. I've, I've heard so many people take this, the next, at least the next verses through the end of chapter 2 and through chapter 3, at least through halfway through chapter 3, and mutilate them so badly because they don't have the capacity to first analyze who will be the recipient of this letter. Who are the intended hearers and listeners? So let me begin by reading, and I'm going to start at verse 10, and I'm going to read for quite some time, so forgive me, but I want you to make a note that this whole entire section I'm about to read should be first treated as an entire section before we can treat the microcosms and each individual thing that lay inside. So, Let's start at verse 11, rather. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The Greek word for warring against the soul, which strategize against the soul. Having your conversation. Again, I said I would treat these individually, but I can't help this. This is not conversation as in, you know, we're talking, but behavior. And in fact, this Greek word will reappear through Peter's writing, through this epistle, and it literally is your behavior from that which you have received as a byproduct of being born again, Christ in you. It's, it, it, it's not just behavior, do, do, don't do. It's something going on inside the believer, having your behavior honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I like the fact that I can read between the lines that uh, although Peter says they might glorify God in the day of visitation, he's also not saying that they'll all be converted either. Contrary to some modern people who'd like to tell you, everyone's going to get converted and everyone's going to see. There's a possibility uh, they may glorify God. It's possible. Now, here comes the tough part. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or as, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And I'd like to put a footnote right there, that you notice Peter just said, king, governor, he's speaking of civil, a civil realm. And then he ends, we would not, we just pass right by this. He says that your behavior and your conduct might be good amongst these people, but listen carefully, because a little tongue in cheek here. He says that ye may silence the ignorance of foolish men. He just is speaking to respect and come under the civil authority because of the, the climate of what was going on in the day, but he also says, read carefully, to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Which foolish men is he declaring of? Perhaps he's speaking of the civil authorities because he just named them. Just put that on for a minute and chew on that. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. I'm going to stop right here. As the servants, as the servants of God. And here the word in the Greek for servants, I'll write it English, is douloi, which, which should be better interpreted as slave, because there's another word in the Greek for servant, which is diakonos, when we get our word deacon. It'd be much better to translate it slave. Slaves of God. Now, I know this will conjure up. For those of you that have been here, it won't conjure up anything bad or malicious because you were here at a time, and I remember when Dr. Scott taught on the beginning, the opening passage of Romans, where Paul 
Paul, an apostle, and he called himself a slave of Jesus Christ. And I still, to this day, I find it unconscionable that a, a man who was here for many, many years, who was kind of a Scott groupie himself, got offended that Dr. Scott should translate this word aright, douloi, as slave. Read what it says. Don't, you know, please don't give me the, oh, the King James is the only translation. Don't mess with the perfect word of God. Stuff. So let's read it properly because this one translation will help us to understand what comes next. He here is speaking of, let's say it right, slaves, slaves, and we'll also say they are suffering, I'm just going to abbreviate, they're suffering slaves or suffering servants of God. They are suffering injustices, which I will describe in a minute. And the next verse, honor all, and I like the King James, the italicized men, which means it's not in the original. That's to show you the little bit of sexist in the translator's uh, vantage point. Honor all men and women. Love the brotherhood, and that needs probably to be explained to some folk. Fear God and honor the king, which is not speaking of King Jesus, but of the earthly dominion, whoever was king at the time. Here we go, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Now, I want to make sure I do this right because everything that I'm going to say is going to hinge on the right understanding between as slaves of God, which we just read, and this here servants, which servants, another Greek word, which is Oiketai. This Greek word at its root has from the word oikos, house. So this is a servant in the house, a slave in the house, which was extremely common in the days first church. In fact, I'll say more on that in a minute. So I want you to just take note. We have slaves of God, servant slave of God, and these are house slaves, house servants. Um, servants, be subject. Submit yourselves to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward, which um, the ones that are unreasonable, harsh, dishonest, those that are not good, even those that are not good. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now, the Stoics leaped on this verse like, you know, honey and bees go together because, oh boy, this is basically, for those who want to interpret it this way, you just got to get a stiff, stiff upper lip and endure. No, that's not what's being said. And I've read, I think, in the vast amount of commentaries and books that I have, I was extremely disappointed to see that no one got to the core issue of what's being said. For even hereunto you were called. You were, he's saying you were called to suffer. You were called to this. Now, listen, this is not going to be a popular message today. I don't think you're going to leave here saying, wow, I'm walking on top of the clouds and the moon. But I want you to have a right understanding because it becomes very apparent that what Peter is doing is he's starting on a civil level. Let's take the whole length of this board and make this the civil level of society. And then he's going to move down to a little bit shorter realm, those that are house slaves, which was a common thing in that day. And he's going to narrow it down even more, believe it or not, to wives. And he's going to narrow it down even more to husbands. And then, for the rest of you all, 
typical New Testament addressing the rest of the people who haven't been addressed, but I want you to take note of something. Unlike, and I'll, I'll continue to read, but unlike the Apostle Paul, who talks about and addresses masters of slaves, there are no masters being directly addressed here, which goes to the theme of what Peter's trying to communicate to his readers. He says, for you were called, for, for, for even hereunto you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges right, righteously. And if you want to know the key to understanding all this, it is that Christ did not try to defend himself. He did not try to paint a different picture, but he committed himself to the one who could judge righteously and could, uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, do what he committed to do. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Likewise, so we have this admonition is now going to continue to the wives. Ye wives, be in subjection, that is to submit to your own husbands as opposed to, and read carefully, as opposed to a behavior that wouldn't be conducive for a wife. People always think this means the, the degradation of the woman, but you must understand the culture for why this needed to be given, and that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the behavior of their wives. While they behold your chaste behavior coupled with fear. And he goes on to describe the moderate apparel that should be of a woman who's adorning. Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel but let it be italicized, the hidden man of the heart. I like that, the hidden man of the heart for a woman. That's good English. Hidden man of, uh, the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, only one verse to the husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And I love what the King James did here. It made it seem as though we're talking about gender, we're talking about strength. And as being heirs together, of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And the last and final exhortation, finally, to be of one mind, and he continues. So I've given you the scope of the address, and I want you to notice that not once in here, not once at all, are the masters being addressed. That is because the framework, the social and historical setting in the Greco-Roman world has much to say about how life was. One only needs to open up the history books and read the period that Peter would have been born into and the Apostle Paul, all living about the same time, to know, number one, they were born into a culture that was not only familiar with slavery, but accustomed to it. They knew nothing else but that. There was not some movement, you'll never read in the Bible, that any of these preached abolition. It, it was, you have to get the framework. Somebody today would say, well, how could you teach on that? Because we don't have slavery anymore. And that's where the modern application is missed. What is being said in this culture? As I said, one only needs to open the history books to read how the civil leaders were unjust, they were corrupt, and the persecution that was meted upon the people, and specifically, the aim is to the Christian reader or recipient, or hearer in this case. 
So in the civil realm, and then if you move down to the house slaves, which was extremely common in Rome at the time, at the period of writing this book, perhaps as many as two-thirds of the populace would have been slaves. When we think of slavery in our culture, we think racial, racial divide. But in fact, the slavery that is spoken of in Rome had nothing to do with racial divide. It had to do with the spoils of war. It definitely had to do and contend with the fact that even a person who was a, born a free person could sell themselves into slavery. So without the background to this, we have no frame of reference. We just think, well, how could, how could Peter say, submit and subject yourself? And there was a design here. So I'm going to try and point out the design and give some clarity because I find, as I said, to avoid these and to treat them as though they're archaic is wrong and to misinterpret them is wrong. So we, we have to have a right starting point. First and foremost, it should be understood that underneath the civil, there was a whole group of people that through his writing, if you'll read through at least the first epistle, you'll read, and we taught, I taught on this before, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow it. But I went in and found all of the different <clears throat> places where it says, Christ hath also suffered once for sins, but the suffering of the people, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, and if you just comb through these, you will find, rejoice in as much as ye are partakers. You are koinoneeing of Christ's sufferings. And I could read, Peter is saying, I am a witness, an eyewitness to the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker. So it's impossible for us to avoid this because Christians, we should start first with the premise, little Christ, those who are following after Christ, will suffer. And it may not be the same suffering we're not saying social injustices like we endure today, but something more profound because he is giving, Peter is giving an instruction on how the suffering is a microcosm of something else. So let me try and see if I can hone down what he's saying. In verses 21 through 24, he does something interesting. Right in the middle of, of this admonition of suffering and instruction, he talks about the suffering servant. And I find that interesting. He lifts right out of Isaiah and talks about the suffering servant, this Jesus. Catch the framework of this and the whole message will begin to come together and take light. Here is the man who when Jesus, during his earthly ministry said, that he needed to suffer many things and go and die. And Peter said, no, Lord, be it, be it far from you. No, no. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. What a change from that man who did that bold proclamation to not want Jesus to suffer to now he's telling us about the suffering, which tells me if I were preaching the resurrection today, I would add this as, a, as one of the cataclysmic changes of Peter, not just that his impetuousness was changed into the bold professor and toned down in moderation for Christ's sake, but the one who said, no, 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 is now telling you, yes, yes, yes. And don't think that it's something strange if it comes upon you because this is the lot of the Christian. I don't even want to see hands. I know the faces. I can't see the faces out there, but I can see the faces in here. I could pick any, any one. There's a few husbands with sick wives. There are a few with sick children. This is not, I'm not telling you I'm calling these things out. I know who you are. And some part of your family might say, I, I don't understand these sufferings. Take the words that are in the book of Hebrews where it, it says he learned obedience may not be only Hebrews. There are many books that declare this. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. How do we learn to be obedient to God's word? Sometimes it's through suffering. And don't think, well, that's an unjust God. I just said at the very start of the message, Christ suffered for us, but he took our sorrows, and the medium, the vehicle of eternal glory is through our sorrows. So you've almost got to go back to the Genesis, pre-incarnate, 
to the genesis of the plague and suffering of mankind. Now, Peter's not taking us back all the way there. I'm just telling you, I see what he is doing in this framework, and he's saying, now, Christ suffered, and Christ could only suffer the things that he suffered. We cannot go, you know, someone could nail me to a cross uh, today, tomorrow, and six weeks from now, and it's not going to save anybody. We heard of a man once that did that. Didn't save anybody. In fact, it made him look pretty foolish, to say the least. And uh, who knows what type of pain he endured, really, for what reason, who knows. But Christ's sufferings were unique to him. He had to do what he did, and it very clearly leaves me with the idea that Peter is conveying a concept to the hearers, and I pray I can convey it to you. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps does not mean you imitate Christ. Please hear me real clear. Thomas Akempis wrote the book, The Imitation of Christ, and you can try and imitate Christ all you want. And I've said before, if you imitate Christ, the world will praise you. But the minute you become Christ-like and spirit-filled, the, the world will probably hate you because they can't stand the true nature and the true light. Just get that straight. We're not imitators. If we only have an imitation, then I don't want it. It's like a good piece of art. Don't give me the cheap thing. Give me the real McCoy or I don't want it at all. I don't want to have to look at the cheap thing and say, well, you know, that's a good try. <laughs> but that you should follow in his steps, an example you should follow in his steps. And I prayed to find an analogy, and I think I found it. I was, at the very end of winter, I went north and tried to cross a road that was covered with snow. And if any of you have ever walked in deep snow, you, if you're smart, because you don't know what lays underneath and how thick the snow is, you try and find steps where somebody else has walked for you so that you can walk in, the, in those footprints and not pierce through the snow. I've done that too. Uh, but this example came to my mind that Christ, picture this snow-covered road, Christ walked ahead and bore the footprints for me. Now, I can't walk in the footprints. Go back to the fleshly example. I may not be able to walk and imitate the person who walked before me in those steps. I don't know. Maybe it was a big, giant man who walked like this. You know, if I walk around like that, doing that, somebody's going to say, what's wrong with that woman? But if I step in those footprints, and I'm imagining now those footprints are the footprints of Christ in the snow that have been traced out for me, and I walk in those steps, there's a very good possibility that I will get to the other side safely because he pierced that foundation before I had to tread it by myself. When we hear Christ gave, leaving us an example, it should be understood even that Greek word has the connotation of tracing out, which is what children do when they're first learning how to write. Usually it's by a stencil, and they write the ABCs, or it's pictures, or whatever, by a stencil, until they learn how to do it themselves. He's speaking, Peter is speaking of this mindset as a pattern for suffering. That is to say, Jesus walked this road already. Now, you don't have to reinvent, you're not going to have to suffer the sufferings he suffered, but if you will put your feet in the place where you know safely he has walked because on the other side of that is resurrected life. So this temporary path to walk in may be difficult, but you don't have to go it alone. And resurrected life is on the other side, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow. He's not saying imitate. You could try and I can try to imitate, and the best thing you might do is look pretty stupid walking somewhere thinking you're walking like Christ. Now, Catch what I'm saying, because there'll, there'll be some folks that say, well, but, but what about imitation? He is not saying that here. He's saying, look to the suffering. You suffering slaves slash servants, look to the suffering servant. See his sufferings and know that there's glory that follows because our affliction, our light affliction, is just for a little while. Don't think it's so long that you can't endure it. And don't think that you have to endure it like a stoic. Giving the pattern, giving the power that's behind this pattern when it says, committed himself to him that judges 
judges righteously. That is to say that the son knew when the father gave him that commission, he said, I must needs be about my father's business, and I came to do the will of the father. He who sent me, he also knew he was able. So the promise given to the readers here is for all these structures, civil, going a little bit further down into the home life, right down to the last bit, even that one line including the husbands, and I'm sure that some husbands find it suffering to endure their wives. <laughs> Just thought I'd make some of you men laugh right now. Because y'all looking at me like... <laughs> but that God was able... Now, if you just take this at its face value, the next thing he does is quite strange. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live righteously, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you're healed. Now, you cannot see this in the English, but I'm going to tell you, and I pray to do this this week on festival. The word for stripes in the Greek is only used here. I'll write it phonetically for you. Molopi. For, and it is a singular, not plural. That may bum some of you out, but I'll tell you why. It is collective. So it's okay for us to say stripes, but Peter's meaning the collective, and the word molopi appears only here, and I would also have you note it does appear in the Septuagint of Isaiah 53 the same way, as a singular blow, as a bruise. But collectively, now I want you to think and connect the dots now of why he's talking to house slaves who would have endured harsh beatings, who would have endured brutality, and certainly would have been familiar with this word, for it carried with it the connotation of bludgeoning or being whipped. So there's a connection in the words here that we don't necessarily see. Now, I want to be clear that when we, when we read this, by whose stripes you were healed, it should be first understood what Peter is referring to in the context. I have no problem of you taking this out to claim your healing if you have sickness. But get the first understanding right, because if you miss the first understanding, you're going to take text out of context even here. He's saying, and many of the other languages confirm it, that with his collective blows, your, your collective sufferings, you're healed. And he's now referring to, it's a double play on words, both sins and the things suffered, and they're not being taken apart. Now, I said you have to go back and find the genesis of why Christ had to bear our sins in his own body. And I made some notes on this, so I pray you'll indulge me on this. And then a few examples out of the Old and New Testament to give some clarity. The first thing is, as I said, his sufferings were voluntary. He did not suffer our sins as a human man would suffer. That wouldn't have done anything for all of humanity. And if you go back to the Genesis, as I said, the need, it is pre-incarnation. It is before he came in a tent of human flesh that dates back to right at the beginning. In fact, if you would go in your own time and read the chapters in Genesis, Right after the fall, you will not find sickness as we know it, sickness today, mentioned for a long, long while. But the first things that crept in as a byproduct of disobeying God are so staggering that, by the way, suffering is one of them. Now, people talk about this concept of the atonement and the suffering and everything that's being embodied in these verses. The first thing I'd say is we all have a disease. Let's park the physical ailments that we incur. We all have a disease. It's a universal disease and it's called sin. There are two conditions that need to be met. The first condition is that we're an atom. As I've said many times, 
Adam's disobedience plunged the blueprint, the DNA, the whole pattern of mankind into the Adamic fallen nature. So you have two things working against you simultaneously. You're born in Adam, so you've got that nature already, and then you have the, what I call the vacuum cleaner event of your life, which is the things that you by free will are free to uh, suck up to your own nature that are the product of your sins committed in your body, not just Adam's nature. Sin and sins, two different things. The root of suffering goes back to the garden. So when Peter is declaring this, it's almost like he's saying, let me tell you the genesis of all the suffering and what he had to bear up under. And only Christ could do what he did. That's why I said that this is not a call for you to imitate. This is a call for you to look at the suffering servant. From the prophet Isaiah's vantage point, understanding that sickness and disease, grief and sorrow, all of these he was acquainted with and he took them to himself. That's why I have no tolerance, zero, for anyone who comes in my presence who says, I know what Jesus did at the cross I know the price he paid that, that will not let go. If he bore them in his body, then he bore them in his body and they're gone. It doesn't, you don't keep saying, but I know I'm forgiven, but, which is the disease of many church people, I'm forgiven, but. There's no buts with Jesus, just that one element, you look to him, the finished work at the cross. So, voluntary suffering, vicariously, an honest soul, this is why I said this flies in the face of everything else going on out there. An honest soul, you, if you are honest, you know there was a sentence of death, as the Apostle Paul said, in your being. A sentence of death because of what you were born in and the life you are living. So vicariously, he went to the tree and bore in his own body the sins, the sorrow, the sickness, so vicarious element in my place, which I'm sure at the time of Peter's writing, many of these people might have misunderstood. They might have even misrepresented. Why the suffering? You ever ask that of yourself, even now, and just bring it forward? Why is somebody you love suffering? Now, why can't God just heal them? Why doesn't this just happen? I'm not God and I can't give you the answers, but I can tell you that by and large, a lot of times the things that we suffer are designed like a magnet to draw us closer to God, not to push us away. And we stupid sheep think we're suffering, so we begin to drift off and fall away thinking, well, God's not taking care of me. If you are a Christian, a little Christ, hear again what I said. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. We learn obedience to God and his word through the things we suffered, because if we never suffered anything, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't understand, we wouldn't have the comprehension that in suffering we press towards the Word of God. So, voluntary sufferings on the part of Jesus, vicarious, expiatory, the capacity to remove the guilt attached with the sin. I don't want to see hands, and I'm sure you, most of you are well taught enough to know he not only carried the sins, but he also took the guilt. If you go back again to Genesis, when God is calling Adam, and Adam, where are you? There was not only the recognition of what had happened, their eyes were open, they knew they were naked, but the sense of shame and guilt, they tried to cover themselves, which is what we perpetually do. We live in a realm that as long as we can cover ourselves, we never have to face God completely and utterly destitute and naked, asking him then to close us with, with his righteousness. Until that comes, you have the guilt concept added to the suffering, and Christ's work was expiatory, canceled out the element of guilt. The atoning work, I'm telling you all the things that are carried in verse 24 as what he carried in his own body on the tree, the atoning work that he could cover fallen man with a covering that no other covering would suffice. This is why I find it very hard when I 
the difficulty for me in modern circles of Christianity. It seems like a, a great repulsive idea to discuss these items as if they're some far removed thing from me or from you. No, no, they pertain to us as individuals and, and each individual should be cognizant of the fact that the things I've chronicled they're individual. Christ didn't go die on the tree for some other person's issues. That may be true, but I personally, my sins personally put him there, just like yours. When that reality hits, you start to realize what Peter is saying as he's explaining the sufferings of Christ. He's also revealed elsewhere the glories that will follow. Your suffering is not as great and is not as uh, vile or volatile as Christ's sufferings, even though you're Christians, you're, you may be suffering for Christ's sake. Your behavior and your conduct in the community, Peter is saying. Be mindful that people are going to hate you. The first century Christians were hated. They were loathed. Why tell the women that they should not adorn themselves? Because it was common practice for the women of the day to be as ornate in their apparel, decked out with every gold tzatzka you can think of, uh, there, there was no semblance, if you will, and particularly in this age that he's writing to, it was nothing. Uh, if you read the historians, read the treatment of the house slaves that the civil leaders would force upon. One of them chronicles Augustus having a battery of slaves on a fire brigade, knowing the fact that if they went out to fight a fire, if they died, who cared? They're just slaves. The mindset was the Christians were the first ones to take the brunt of anything. Peter's saying, brothers and sisters, if you're suffering, suffer for Christ's sake. And essentially what people are going to see in your suffering is what they will see of Jesus. Now, we're not told to be Stoics and just bite your lip but this is the picture he's painting. That's why I said it's very difficult to convey and teach this right. But again, I must point this out, it's a, it's a sidebar, that there's no possible way for us to read the Gospels and not see, because of the translation, how many times Jesus used servant, which should be rightly translated slave, either when he spoke of himself or when he spoke of his disciples. This is not a foreign concept. And in fact, the greatest passage to tell you about why we are given this pattern, this is Peter's own words. If you want it in the Apostle Paul's words about our concept of suffering, read Philippians 2 where it says that he, Jesus, thought it not robbery, he took the form of a man, emptied himself, suffered as a servant, suffered as a servant. And God lifted him up, gave him a name above every name. The pattern is there. Now, bring this into the modern frame. I'm not saying that it's okay for people to be mistreated. And I'm simply not going to tell you. There's too many folks within Christianity who love to tell you, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. I got a clear demonstration of that last night, of somebody not able to turn the other cheek. And all I can tell you is that most Christians don't even know what that means. They think it means, okay, I'll give you the other side. Now do this one too, because I like that one so much, I'll give you this one. The mindset of what Peter's describing for the readers at the time, when you're unfairly treated for Christ's sake, let God vindicate you. You want me to put it in terms that you'll understand right here? I'll make it real plain. Many years ago, I was be being treated unfairly by a lot of people who thought, I was fair game to take pot shots at. And I tell you as a congregation, because I want nobody to say afterwards, well, what about you, Pastor Scott? Because it's got to pass through me first. If I could transport myself back in time, oh, say about six years ago, rather than doing what I did, I would have just said simply, the Lord will work it out and leave it be. Because frankly, if I can't trust God, in the things that are coming over me where I'm persecuted and people are treading me down. Exactly what Jesus said, if I can't trust God enough in my sufferings that he'll bring me through, 
that he'll vindicate me, then I don't even know why I'm a Christian. Do I, need, do I need to be Christian only when things are good? I need the God who's going to carry me through my suffering. I need the God who's going to vindicate me when I'm being fairly accused. I need the same God who went to the tree. For those of you who are sick, go back to the universal sickness, the first goer. I'm not telling you you're sick because you sin. I'm telling you sickness abounds because of Adam's disobedience the first place, not yours. There was no sickness in the world, not, not no sickness at all in the world before the fall. Sickness came as a byproduct afterwards, and the root of the sickness is dealt in sin with his stripes. You were healed. Now, you may say, that's a hard pill for me to swallow. I know I'm forgiven, and I know I'm made whole but I just can't bear the fact that I'm going to have to go through life. You telling me, Pastor, if I got 20, 30, 40, how many years left I got that I may have to endure suffering, suffering for either being a Christian, suffering for living in a community that looks on me with disdain for my beliefs. Well, I'm telling you what Jesus said. In the world, you'll have tribulation. In the world, you're going to be persecuted, and they're going to hate you for his sake, not for mine. I'm always just the, the, the scapegoat. I'm always the one that conveniently, it's the pastor that can always get, be blamed. The real reality is it's not about you or me. It's Christ in you and in me that's hated. Now, there are folks that love us and embrace us in the community, and there are other people that they just think we're the most disdainful lot. I don't care about trying to lift myself and vindicate myself because I know what I'm going through or what I've been through or what you're going through is just a short time. It may feel like an eternity while you're going through it, but at least have the mindset, like the Apostle Paul said, you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Read that verse where it says, tribulation, patience, and the kingdom of God. Well, tribulation, we all know what that comes from, the Latin word for the sifting or the tearing of the wheat. Patience is endurance, and we all know, we should know what the kingdom of God looks like. That's the pathway to get there. And believe me, you will not have suffering. The folks that are listening to me right now, you won't have anything to suffer until you commit your way to Christ, until you, until you lay down your life. When I say you are to present yourself as a living sacrifice, too many folks say, okay, you know what? The problem is we're alive, so it's so easy to crawl off the altar because we haven't died to sin. It's so easy to crawl off the altar and go back to whatever you were doing, and you can still look back at the altar and say, I was there, and maybe in some vicarious method think, well, it's sufficient that I placed myself there once. No. No and no. The only way that you and I get the victory is through this pattern. Now, I know, as I said, it's difficult. The concept of even submitting, which I've heard people, including a politician, some of you know the reference that a prominent female politician made to the fact that she submits herself to her husband. And if you hear somebody, raise your hand. Okay, and see how quickly the media jumped on her and said, well, what kind of behavior is this? Well, she had to go back and qualify to say that she wants her husband's approval. She wants him, she wants to please him, and she wants his approval. Now, you tell me, as a Christian, and even not as a Christian, why did you get married in the first place if you don't want to please your spouse? It's kind of a stupid thing. So I like her answer, even though it was a little bit more toned down. It still went back to the main principle. No, these people are not subjecting themselves for the sake of some weak vessel that cannot uh, do anything else, but rather subjecting yourself because the difference between a servant, a doulos, a slave of God, and a servant of the world. By the way, I should point out that this word oketai, or oiketai, has to do primarily with servitude in the world versus the servants of God, the slaves of God. And that's all that Peter is pointing out. He is not talking about, for us today, how you need to, husbands, lord it over your wives, or if you have a bad boss. One guy wrote an article, and his article was based on this, and, it, and the article was, when you got a bad boss, what do you do? Well, 
you know what, when you're out in the world and you've got a bad boss and you don't like your boss and your boss is giving you a tough time, uh, you do what you need to do. Um, you know, don't, don't write an article and put a halo around it and say, now, this is the thing here, you just got to suck it up. Well, if you, wanna, if you want your behavior to be seen and you're ready to take the endurance, but he's speaking within the Christian realm, not within the worldly realm. And he's pointing this out very clearly between servants of God, slaves of God, and these things that fall under the category of the world. So when people talk to me about this whole passage, I look to it and I think, no, I think very clearly. Peter knew what he was doing. He knew what he was saying. Very clear, uh, articulated the, the nature and the purpose and the result of Christ's suffering and the purpose and the nature and the result of ours. From this very passage, I could take you into the potter's house and make the potter's house, the message of the potter's house, apply to this very passage. How else are we molded and shaped into the likeness of Christ? You know, it's not by the uh, niceties of life. It's by the harshness. It's by the, it's by the losses. It's by the things we endure. And believe me, there isn't a thing that comes into our lives that God has not seen or let for some purpose. Now, you want to go back to thinking that Christianity is a candy cane walk and everything's sweet and syrupy, and you keep that mindset, I really believe you're going to have a sweet walk, but it's going to be a sugar, a sugar high on some other source. It's not going to be God. The, the, yeah, thank you. The Christian, I've said this many times, the Christian is a walking paradox, suffering at the same time with the comfort and knowledge that God is taking care. The Lord will vindicate me. The Lord's going to win the battle for me. The Lord's already overcome. I don't have to try and figure out the nature or the cause is irrelevant. He just, Peter, just chronicles here, even right down to the husbands and wives. Why do you think he included wives primarily and one verse for the husbands? There were many women married to unbelieving men. There were many women at the time of his writing that probably were being treated very bad and suffering for it. I, I really would love for some of you to read the history at the time of this writing and see what the home life would be, which is radically different from our comfort zone of today. So simply put, superimpose this over a couple of scriptures and you have the gist of this. Romans 5 says we are to glory in tribulations. That is not anything but boasting in tribulations. Have you boasted about your tribulations lately? Didn't think so. Neither have I. But there's a whole bunch of references in the New Testament to this. And why do you think? Because even the disciples, when they were falsely accused and thrown in prison, they counted it a joy. They counted it a joy that they were suffering for Christ's sake. Now, I pray that attitude would come over some of the folks that I meet, that they just, when suffering comes, they just can't, they can't deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. <laughs> but then the mind, for you on radio, I just lifted my hands like I'm, it's for me. But the antidote for our sufferings is that Jesus paid it all. The antidote for our sins, Jesus paid it all. The antidote for the sickness in your body today, Jesus paid it all. And it may be a very simplistic message, but what, as I said, what I find comforting in all this is there's no mention, Peter's not writing to the ones that are subjecting this, he's not telling He's not saying now to you governors, now to you officials. He's telling the readers what they should be doing towards these probably because of what is happening to them. He's telling the house slaves, be it a thankworthy thing if you suffer for Christ's sake. He's telling the wives, likewise, one verse for the husband and then for the rest of you. I ask you today if you are suffering, if you have been going through or been put through the ringer, and I, I can tell you honestly, the, this message, the one thing it should do is it should bring you comfort. No, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with you. Don't listen to the people that say there's something wrong with you because you have trouble. There's something wrong with you because you're suffering. There's ver something very right with you 
If you're going through something right now, or you have been going through, or you are repeatedly going through, it means that God's hand is upon you, and everything that you are going through, He sees. And I really believe in the process of seeing, He's also watching. Really believe my word? You really believe my word and my son? Because if I vindicated and rose up my son from the dead, I'm able to do it for you. That's the message of 1 Peter, comfort and suffering. Hopefully, some of you will be comforted. I can't offer you the easy way, but I can offer you the way that's laid out here for suffering and the glories that follow in Christ Jesus are yours to claim both the sufferings and the glories today. That's my message. I pray at least for some of you it'll help understand what he's saying, and apply it to yourselves today. Uh, I want to read something that I wanted to share with you, which uh, for me had a profound impact through these scriptures we just shared together. My feet tired, my steps slipped. At my master's cross, I did find my grip. The hold I took from the fires below I found he will not let me go. My eyes I did see, the king clothed in cloth that was for me. He wore my semblance and my shame. My sins, they could not with me remain. Though my feet still tire, my steps he now guides. I know that he walks right by my side. My eyes may grow dim, but glory awaits. Jesus paid the price for me to enter heaven's gates. Now. I'm not telling you that I've had to suffer what Christ has had to suffer, but that came out of my heart from these scriptures to tell you, hold on and don't let go. God is faithful to perform his work in you and to bring it to completion. Don't forget that. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.